Oh, you could have been a good girl But instead you chose the real world Yeah, you've always been a savage Oh, you've always been a bad chick after Baki returned to Japan, Captain Stridum came to find him. It seems that Stridum wants Baki to meet someone. He asks Baki what's the most powerful animal that's ever lived. Baki replies that it is a lion, a tiger, or a bear. Stridum says not the most powerful alive today, the most powerful ever. Baki thinks it's a Tyrannosaurus Rex. However, Stridum sends him an article about a man said to be stronger than Tyrannosaurus Rex. Stridum calls him a male. He says that some workers discovered a Tyrannosaurus Rex and a primitive man inside a salt rock. The man almost looks like he was attacking the T-Rex. The original man's body and the T-Rex were taken to a research facility in the United States. Albert Payne, a Nobel Prize winner, will be responsible for the research and preservation of the man's body and the T-Rex. Alan asks Albert we're going to revive him, right? Albert says that in the year 2000, in New Mexico, Professor Russell Breland discovered tiny drops of water in a piece of 250 million year old rock salt. Once he'd extracted it, he found that it was seawater from 250 million years ago. And what's more, there were microorganisms from that period carefully preserved in it. He placed them in a controlled environment, with the ideal combination of nutrition, stimulation, and temperature. And after 120 days, every one of those microorganisms had been revived. They were waiting, waiting 250 million years for the ideal living conditions to reappear. It was the salt. The salt in that 1,000 meter thick rock salt layer had preserved them, pickled them, in a way. It protected them from the inescapable forces of time. So it's possible, theoretically at least, that we can bring the man here back to life. They called the primitive man Pickle. Day 91 of Professor Payne's Pickle Revival Project. A massive array of monitors has been attached to Pickle's body, ready to measure any physiological and neurological activity. And since Pickle lived during the Jurassic period, the temperature in the lab has been adjusted accordingly. Pickle has been immersed in a solution that almost replicates his bodily fluids. And this device perfectly mimics the cycle of the tides and the tempo that is the mother of all life. But despite all these efforts, Pickle has not awakened. Alan thinks the experiment is a failure. He returns to the observation room and eats while reading the magazine. Suddenly, he comes up with a way to make himself famous by being the first to eat a T-Rex. Albert discovered this muscle tissue from the T-Rex is identical to the tissue sample found in the contents of Pickle's stomach. He was sure the T-Rex wasn't preying on him, but he was preying on it. Alan is cooking a dish from T-Rex meat. The scent of the T-Rex meat reaches Pickle, waking him up. Alan cooked a Tyrannosaurus Rex steak. It tastes like beef, lamb, or that whale he had in Japan. At the lab, Pickle waking from his sleep of 200 million years, the man sat stunned and bewildered. The things he saw were incomprehensible to him. A wall of lights, straight lines running vertically and horizontally, transparent objects. None of these things had even existed when he was last awake, just a short time before. Surrounded by all these mysteries, there was one thing that was familiar to him. A smell. Yes, this was something he recognized and it was coming from somewhere down there. Alan is enjoying his dinner when Pickle appears behind him, causing him to shiver and panic. Pickle reaches for the meat and puts the whole 150 grams in his mouth at once. He smells Alan's scent and then turns to leave, assuming he wasn't food. Alan takes this opportunity to get a pistol from the drawer. Pickle immediately senses Alan's malice and wants to attack him. Alan accidentally pulls the trigger, but even 9mm bullets were unable to penetrate the abdominal muscles of the Jurassic Warrior. He hurls the bullets at Alan, which injures him and causes him to panic. Pickle lunges at him and shakes him. Alan realizes he seems to be trying to communicate. Pickle pushes him against the wall. Alan staggers to the T-Rex's lab for cover. Just as Pickle is about to attack him again, the smell of the T-Rex catches his attention. He steps inside, and Alan immediately closes the door to imprison him. He then calls the police. Albert asks him why he called this ridiculous crowd. He is sure that there is nothing they can do. The captain of the police squad arrives and announces that his men are going to storm it now. But depending on how it goes, they might not be able to take him alive. Albert asks him to call the military. The captain recognizes the person in front of him as Albert Payne, a Nobel laureate. He paid his respects to him. However, he still ignores Albert's warnings about Pickle's strength. Suddenly, Pickle breaks through the wall and rushes to attack the police vehicles. Witnessing Pickle's tremendous strength, the police captain immediately calls the army. Albert says, Pickle's become enraged because his rival has been stolen from him. Troops are quickly on the way. 
The army was, in fact, quite happy to be deployed because the mission provided the perfect opportunity to test out a new, top-secret weapon that was in development. Halbert tries to explain to the army that that man is a living treasure, a treasure precious to all humanity. That naked savage squatting on the ground is more important to the future of the human race than any world leader. The commander respects Albert because he won the noble, so he will capture the target without harming him. This weapon won't officially be deployed until next year. They call it the MPBM, the Multi-Purpose Battle Machine. For the last two and a half years, the operators have been virtually living in it, using it for all their daily activities. The result is, they can now do absolutely anything with it. They can subdue a pride of lions, destroy tanks, even knit a sweater. The commander asks, why does he keep sitting in one spot without moving? Albert explains that he's defending something. Maybe he's defending his era. Pickle lunges at the modern armor with his bare hands. He breaks through with one punch. The pilot is scared and intends to kill Pickle. But Pickle can resist the rotation of the robot's arm and cause it to be damaged. Captain Stridum received orders to deploy the latest tanks, the latest attack helicopters, and the best armed troops to capture only one man. He approaches Pickle. When faced with one powerful individual, though a soldier well-versed in modern weaponry, he was still a man. And as a man, he felt growing deep within him a feeling even stronger than respect. For the first time since he had rewakened, Pickle saw eyes that weren't looking on him as an enemy. Stridum says, I want to know your story. He couldn't understand the words, of course. But even so, it was still possible to communicate. I'm going to take you to a place where there are others just like you. It's called Japan. TV is broadcasting live that a flight has landed in Japan. That's a military plane. Inside of it is what's been causing a stir in the US, a primitive man. They do say he was revived from the Jurassic period. He's arrived, guarded by a crowd of soldiers. Baki sweats looking at him and is sure that he is extremely strong. A female reporter runs over to interview Pickle. She quickly paid the price for her actions. The guards tried to stop him, but to no avail. After mating is complete, he goes to sleep. In a live broadcast, Professor Albert says the 100 million years of the dinosaurs, from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous periods, came to a sudden end when a giant meteor struck the Earth. He thinks everyone knows the story so far. But when the giant meteor collided, an enormous cloud of dust billowed into the atmosphere, blocking out the sun's heat. The surface of the Earth was instantly plunged to the same temperature as space, negative 270 degrees Celsius. Everything on Earth became frozen. The giant dinosaurs and the insects, as well as all battles. The impact shifted the plates of the Earth's crust. As a result, the usually stable salt rock stratum preserved this battle. As for the two beings discovered preserved in salt earlier, one was too badly damaged to revive. But one remains whole. As for the incident earlier at Hainda Airport, he feels nothing but regret for the female reporter who was the victim. However, you must understand that he came from the Earth 200 million years ago, which may as well be a completely different planet. The values and morals that we all hold mean absolutely nothing to him. Ordinary citizens have descended on the front gate of the U.S. military base. Since the victim was a popular news reporter, there are hundreds of demonstrations. The U.S. military has not made any comment regarding the rape by the primitive man. Due to this, the demonstration anger has reached its peak. Yujiru Hama knows Pickle is here, and he's coming through but is stopped by three guards. Meanwhile, Ritsu is also sneaking inside. A soldier wonders if Pickle likes things like this. A tire, magazines, a fish tank. And this, it seems too obvious and simple. Ritsu feels like sneaking into a woman's bedroom. A guard arrives, and Ritsu immediately hides behind him. He can get around like this for the time being. Yujiru tells the protesters to stand back because these guys are going to go flying. A demonstrator recounted that it was really hot near him, like an engine or something. Then suddenly, the soldiers started punching each other right in front of the guy in black. The last guy didn't even try to stop them. He started punching himself. The man in black just stood and watched. Eventually, he walked up to the gate. The soldiers continued to punch each other. It was like, you know, when unruly brothers were caught doing mischief by their strict father, and they tried to pin the blame on each other. Like they were punishing themselves before their father could punish them. The three men didn't try to stop. But then, Yujiru told them to stop. It was like an order from the commander-in-chief. They stopped instantly. Then he said something strange. You men made the right choice. If even one of you had run off instead of fighting, I would have slaughtered you then and there. But if you'd attack me, your fate would have been the same. So, as a last resort, you decided to harm one another, to harm yourself. That was the best, the right thing to do. I'll forgive you. Their expression then looked relieved. But they were plainly beaten to a pulp. 
Then Yujiru just cuts right through the lock with his bare hand and goes inside, like it is his own home. Nobody stopped him. Meanwhile, Ritsu is still following the guard to Pickle's place. As long as he matches his breathing to the guards, this guard won't notice me. When he arrives, he knocks the guard unconscious. He enters the place where Pickle is being held and sees that the ventilation doors are open. It's as if someone snuck in before him. That is Shinogi. Both came here to fight Pickle. Shinogi says that he got here first, so Pickle will be his prey. Suddenly the dinosaur statue inside the cage shakes. It turns out that inside is Orochi. Jack heard their noises, so he also showed up. Goki is also here, and Katsumi also comes to join the fun. The Sea King Jaku appeared from the ventilation hole in the ceiling. This is getting embarrassing. The old and the young, covering ourselves in black, as if they're playing ninjas. They're all a similar breed. They want to fight so badly that they can't stand it. That's why they broke in. In that case, who will fight Pickle? But before that, they'd better see what Pickle's up to. He's sleeping. Look at him taking it easy, even with all this commotion out here. Goki wonders if he even thinks they're his enemies. Jack kicks the tree to wake him up. Pickle steps outside to pee. Yujiru appears and welcomes him to the future, surprising everyone. He calls the fighters here a ragtag mob. Katsumi angrily attacks him, and immediately his shoelaces are removed. Yujiru throws the shoelaces at his face and tells him to go play Cat's Cradle in the corner. He tells everyone to get out of the way. He's coming in. He just walks in and through the bulletproof glass to face Pickle. Yujiru says that you're a warrior from ancient earth, but you're named after a salted vegetable. If you can't understand what I say, then sense my meaning, like an infant who can't understand language understands their meaning mother's love. Know in your heart our feelings towards you. The eight assembled here, as well as I, have come to fight you. A duel of muscle strength in the hand took place. Pickle gets excited because in front of him is a T-Rex. Yujiru made a move to push Pickle down. Pickle stood up. That simple action alone captivated the eyes of all the warriors. By submitting to civilization, many of our body's abilities have disappeared. But from a body that fully maintains those abilities, even the simplest of actions are beautiful. Having seen this, how could they just meekly leave? A voice from the loudspeaker tells them to stop and asks Mr. Yujiru to step outside. The building is completely surrounded. Commander Henry comes and is sorry to bother him while he was enjoying himself. He explains that this is not an arrest. The US Army doesn't have the ability to arrest him. Judging from the fact that the guards at the gate couldn't call for backup, he knew it must be the ogre, Yujiru Hanma. As a soldier, he is savoring the honor of meeting him. He explains that Pickle is a cultural treasure to all of humanity. He is a living world heritage. Henry begs Yujiru to retreat. Yujiru agrees on one condition. Let the other eight leave as well. Those guys aren't here to destroy or steal anything. Like him, they just came to say hello to Pickle. And thus, the curtain closed on the saga of the world's most fearsome evening intrusion. At a cafe, Rumina asks Baki, do you think you can beat Pickle? Baki replies that he has no interest in that primitive man. Furthermore, that guy is a cultural treasure. He's a precious asset to humanity. And to fight him, that's as impossible as making a pyramid your home. Baki doesn't want to become the best fighter in the world. He just wants to fight his dad and beat him. Baki then goes to Ritsu to beg him to teach him Kung Fu. But Ritsu refuses because, right now, he is not interested in anything at all. His mind is only on going to fight the guy from the Jurassic period. Baki tries to explain to Ritsu that Pickle's an important treasure of culture and humanity. Ritsu already understands that fully. He is not someone to be fighting. He is fully aware of that. But his desire to fight a man, it is much like love. He wants to know him better. He wants to touch him. He wants to grasp him. It's very similar. Right now, he is burning with passion for that embodiment of savagery that has come from the distant past. These skills that have been developed over 4,000 years, he wants to see how that ancient man responds to them. At the arena, the army holds Pickle in Tokugawa's underground arena. Pickle hasn't eaten anything but water for a month. Professor Albert explains that he is an extremely proud warrior, an ambitious fighter. He won't eat anything except enemies that fight him. Captain Stridham says that a fierce fighting bull brought from Spain, one of the largest bears from Kamchatka, and even a lion. They each took just a glance at Pickle, who just sat there and fled. The lion even ran off with its tail between its legs. He wins the battle of the Jurassic period versus the present without even fighting. But there is still one fighter that has not been tried. It cost a pretty penny, since it's a protected species in danger of going extinct. Captain Stridham hopes this can be forgiven. They're doing it all for this one irreplaceable man. 
It hasn't eaten for five days. It's in the perfect state. The Siberian tiger is a beast and the most powerful of the felines. This one is 4.7 meters long and weighs 490 kilos. It's one of the largest of its kind. In other words, it's the most powerful beast on the planet. Pickle stood up. The tiger thinks Pickle is its prey. Pickle thinks the same of it. How terrifying. It's nothing to be surprised about. Whether it's a tabby cat or a Siberian tiger, if it attacks him, it's food in his eyes. However, the Siberian tiger is on the verge of extinction. But one has now become food for that pickle. Intellectuals in every field and conservation groups have vehemently protested. Some organizations plan to hold even more demonstrations. Ritsu goes to Tokugawa and asks him, Finding food for pickle is giving you trouble, right? How about if I become its food? It'd be quite a spectacle. Pickle vs. Sea King Ritsu Albert considers that's ridiculous when a human is against Pickle. Captain Stridum and Tokugawa tell Albert to calm down because he says himself that he wants to do this. It seems like nothing, but it's amazing how he can sleep like that. Nearly all animals in nature go into hiding when they sleep. But just look at this brazenness. He's completely defenseless. Lions on the savanna are that way, so this must be natural for Pickle as well. In nature's food chain, this behavior is only practiced by those at the top. The sleeping posture of kings, where he existed wasn't as forgiving as the savannah. The natural world then was on a totally different scale. The age of battling rivals, the Jurassic period. Even so, look how he sleeps. Ritsu is entering the arena. Pickle immediately wakes up after sensing danger. The insanely savage man sensed he was facing an insanely worthy opponent. He's taken up a fighting stance for the first time. Ritsu will throw everything he's got at him. He'll never have this chance again. Ritsu wants to test Pickle's strength by getting close to him. Pickle unleashes a punch that pushes Ritsu to the wall. Ritsu understood. A fight of sheer strength is pointless. He'll use all his tricks. Ritsu rushes to attack the weak points in Pickle's body. Everyone is shocked to see Pickle crying. Blows to the chin. That was six straight blows to the chin. Pickle must be suffering from concussions. At least several thousand of them. Suddenly, Pickle raises his arms high and lands on Ritsu's body, causing him to temporarily lose consciousness. Then he bites him and eats him. The pain caused Ritsu to wake up and resist. His punches have no effect on him. He's taking off his shoes, which are like gloves, and fighting bare-knuckled. However, his blows still had no effect. Four thousand years of history have utterly no effect on Pickle. Ritsu decides not to use Kung Fu anymore and uses the windmill punch. Strategy, tactics, plans, efficiency, and all other tricks he completely abandoned. He used only his pure emotions. It was probably the oldest weapon of last resort in human history, but the results were such a pathetic sight. Pickle was confused. He feels that the current Ritsu is as weak as a female. However, Ritsu subconsciously used a move. He thought he decided not to use any moves, principles, or skill. He did it again. He heard someone calling him. It's another Ritsu. He is the one Ritsu aims to be. To protect his martial arts, Ritsu used the windmill punch, abandoning all martial arts. But the martial arts didn't abandon him. Ritsu regains his composure and uses Kung Fu to attack Pickle. He decides to believe in his own martial arts. Trust in them. Trust entirely in himself. And trust everything to the bosom of martial arts. Pickle is knocked down. Professor Albert must concede that martial arts truly is something amazing. He never imagined Ritsu would be able to hold on this long. Tokugawa thinks Albert misunderstood. Ritsu is not just holding on, he's clearly defeated him. That last blow of his. Don't you have any idea how strong of a concussion that gave Pickle? Albert says that Pickle hasn't gotten a concussion. When Pickle was discovered at the nuclear waste isolation plant in Colorado, they naturally ran him through a full battery of tests. His muscle tissue, bones, and organs were all complete surprises to them. But most striking of all was his cervical spine. Its thickness and durability are incredible. The necks of bipedal creatures, like we humans, can't even compare structurally to his. You only find something comparable if you consider large four-legged beasts, whose necks must constantly support the weight of an enormous head. The circumstantial evidence only points to one conclusion. Until a certain period in Pickle's life, he was most likely a quadruped. The secret arts that have continued to be passed down since ancient China. The system can only be described as incredible. However, the target of these innumerable skills has only been humans. Against bipeds. Just look. Just look at that stance. An unfamiliar forward bent posture. The starting crouch of a sprinter. The starting stance of a sumo wrestler. It's not like either of those. It's even lower than those. The closest thing to it is. The attack stance of a beast. Then Ristu decides to answer him. He won't run, dodge, or retreat. This weapon is symbolic of Kung Fu, the crushing fist. 
He'll smash him with this. At that moment, the beast's body ignited. His entire body turned to flame. Like when he vanquished the T-Rex, he only uses the attack against his most powerful enemies, his greatest of the day. And upon the extraordinary Kung Fu fighter, Si King Ritsu released it. The impenetrable modern shield against the strongest ancient spear. On this day, the spear was the indisputable winner. Suddenly, Pickle is crying again. Albert asks Tokugawa why are you surprised? What's about to happen is only natural. It's dinner time. Tokugawa doesn't accept this. He rushes to Pickle and shouts are you really going to eat your friend? How can you call yourself a human? Pickle angrily knocks Tokugawa unconscious. Eating is the way of saying goodbye. It is a damnable fate. His appetite was ferocious. In the stillness, the primitive man's heart was full of sorrow. Albert arrives and injects Pickle with anesthetic. Thanks to that, Risu is still alive, but one of his legs was eaten. He wakes up feeling guilty for breaking his promise. He is good as lied to Pickle. If I lose, I'll be eaten. That wasn't the promise that he made. How shameful. Baki visits him and can't believe that all the rumors are true that Ritsu were bitten and eaten. Baki heard from Tokugawa about what happened. Baki says, you transform your body into a weapon. That is the life you've lived, but now you've lost part of your body. It's a horrific event. Yet it's not the missing leg that's causing you pain, but your inner turmoil. That pain, please take pride in it. See King Ritsu is an unparalleled martial artist. You're a treasure to the great country of the People's Republic of China. Ritsu thanks Baki for his words of encouragement. At this time, Orochi receives a call from Tokugawa, who informs him of the result of the match between Pickle and Ritsu. Orochi is surprised to learn that Ritsu was eaten. This news spread among the Atsuki base reunion members like wildfire. At Pickle's room, the door was broken, and he escaped. The only other time this door was broken in history was when Yujiru Hanma did it. This guy named Takeshi Kenmachi, 21 years old. In each of the dojos and gyms he went to, there was nobody on par with him. He is looking for someone to fight. He wouldn't kill them, but he wouldn't leave them uninjured either. He was hoping to find a playmate like that this night. When he stops by an alley to pee, Pickle drags him inside the dumpster, but not to eat him. Pickle wants to steal his clothes and put them on. Color, color, light, color, fire, stars, heat. Pickle was confused. There wasn't a single thing that he recognized. He was more lost than Yurishima Taro. In his era, he only ate whatever attacked him. Fight, win, eat. He was proud. But what is he now? Now he wears these clothes like a disguise. He can't survive otherwise. He understands that. He stands 2 meters tall and weighs over 130 kilos. He was hungry. He hadn't eaten since earlier. He was hit by a truck while crossing the road. He left a dent the shape of his body. The driver rushes over to check on him, but he gets up and thinks the truck is prey. He rushes to attack the truck and disassemble all of its parts. Inside is pork, and he immediately ate it, which shocked everyone. The news that Pickle had escaped reached the ears of the martial artists. At the Shinshinkai Dojo, Katsumi is gathering everyone to prepare revenge for Ritsu. Pickle is currently on the loose. The police are searching for him. There are 43,000 police officers, while there are 55,000 members of Shinshinkai in Tokyo. They'll get a jump on them. At this moment, Pickle is wandering the red light district. He is being consulted by a waiter for 3,000 yen for a fun time with a girl. But a member of the Shinshinkai Dojo interferes with his business. He says he was friends with Pickle and wants to take him away. The waiter felt they were not friends. Meanwhile, Katsumi is having an argument with his father. Orochi disagrees with his actions now and says, You can't win against Pickle. Katsumi refers to Orochi's statement when he was chairman that there'd be differences of opinion at the branch chief's meetings at times. When that happened, this is what you always said. We're all karate fighters here. Set this with a match. Orochi and Katsumi will have a battle right here to solve this problem. Members of the Shinshinkai Dojo are threatening the waiter to take Pickle away. But the waiter's boss came. They didn't expect it to be Haneyama. The guy introduces himself as Terada from Shinshinkai. He apologizes for offending him in some way. But this is the wish of Chairman Katsumi. The fight between the two men sent the knife flying towards Pickle. Pickle tries to catch it but is stopped by Haneyama. Both are grabbing the knife, causing it to break. Meanwhile, Katsumi is having a match with his father. Orochi is defeated. Katsumi apologizes for using that technique on his father. At this point, Pickle punches Haneyama in the face. Haneyama's junior rushes to attack him, and Pickle breaks his arm bone. Terada also rushes to prevent Pickle from leaving and is knocked unconscious immediately. However, Haneyama once again appears in front of Pickle and tells him to stay here for a while. Pickle dashes away like a spear but is still stopped by Haneyama. Pickle senses Haneyama's power like a dinosaur. This man who stood in his way. 
This man who is smaller than him. He has the same strength as the worthy rivals he once battled in his land. Hanayama unexpectedly pushes Pickle back, for this man was tied to numerous social circumstances, duty, kindness, obligation, promises, from the logic and wisdom that sprung from his network of relationships. He's gained a godlike strength that defied human understanding. Pickle's rivals were nothing compared to this man's godlike inner strength. He had been waiting to meet someone worthy of fighting with all his strength. But Hanayama says it's over, you're late, Baki. Thanks for letting me know, Hanayama. Baki felt that Pickle is very beautiful. Anything honed for one purpose alone, stripped of everything superfluous, is beautiful. Whether the purpose is good or evil, the human heart can't help but be enamored. The functional beauty for running, leaping, catching, and hunting. A body perfectly adapted solely for the purpose of fighting. To Baki's eyes, nothing seemed more beautiful. Baki Hanma was viewed as the world's most powerful young man. So just how would he react? The group of fighters, the members of Karate's Shinchinkai, watched with bated breath. Baki says, he wasn't planning on doing anything when they met. When he heard from Tokugawa that Pickle had escaped, he asked Hanayama to let him know if he caught wind of anything. He just wanted to meet him. He really did. That's all. Pickle raises his fist like Yujiru did before. Baki responds to his invitation and is immediately pushed down. Having seen this body filled with overpowering functional beauty, Baki knew it had also made full mastery of the modern martial art of Aikido. As if faced with coquetry from a woman he adored, Baki was barely able to maintain his self-control. Then the Hanma blood flowing in his veins suddenly burst its limits and attacks Pickle. Pickle doesn't attack back, but he wants Baki to go with him. Katsumi arrives and learns that Baki and Hanayama went with him. After knocking out his father, he came here in high spirits, only to find that Pickle was gone. Katsumi bows his head and begs everyone to help him find Pickle. Pickle takes Baki to Tokugawa's arena. Baki never thought he'd come here. He asks, so, what is it you want to do now that you've brought me here? Tokugawa shouts that he's picking a fight with you, Baki. Then Baki'll have to accept. Hanayama reminds Baki, that are you sure you want to get this naive guy involved? Hanayama's reminder wakes up Baki. He was about to repeat the same mistake he made five years ago. While he was explaining, Pickle rushes to kick Baki out of the arena. Tokugawa thinks they should take him away before he's eaten. Pickle starts dancing and is raising his fist above his head. It's the same. In the past as in the present, victory is celebrated the same way. While Katsumi is training, Ritsu comes looking for him. Ritsu has heard a strange rumor that members of Shinshinkai are trying to get vengeance for him. Katsumi confesses to Ritsu that he himself is the one who demanded it. Katsumi admits that vengeance is a slogan he uses for convenience. If someone is strong, he wants to fight them. Ritsu asks do you think your karate can defeat him? Katsumi doesn't know, but if he's got a chance to win, he'll fight. But he won't if he doesn't. Ritsu says that there have been 4,000 great years of kung fu history, while karate has only been around for 500 years since its arrival in Okinawa. Today, as everyone looks towards its 500 first year, Ritsu wants to assist Katsumi with that 500 first year, a union with the 4.00 once year of Kung Fu. Yes, this was the 500 first year of karate. A revolutionary trail is about to be trodden. The next morning, Baki thinks he won't be able to sleep for a while. That alone gave him plenty to enjoy. He can tell what he is, how great he is. With that single blow, they're buddies. That level that he knew he could never achieve the way he is now. But with him, he can surpass it. At Shinshinkai Dojo, Ritsu is demonstrating a move known as Mock Punch. He asks Katsumi to hone this move and make it ever quicker. In the long history of Kung Fu, he believes there is only one who has ever mastered this move, see Emperor Kaku. At Tokugawa's arena, they successfully anesthetize Pickle with 140 dozen barrels of chloroform. They urgently need to build a facility that can properly contain him. Tokugawa thinks that there's no need for a facility to lock Pickle up. He won't leave here. After he kicked Baki, during the few hours before he was put to sleep with the chloroform, he didn't make a single move to leave. Even though he has the strength to burst down a steel door, he stayed here of his own accord. He realizes now that this is an oasis. As long as he stays here, he'll never run out of food or companions. When Pickle wakes up, he won't try to escape. No need for those guards. He won't run. Pickle wakes up, and just as Taukugawa had predicted, he doesn't run away. He continues to sleep, waiting for his food and friends. Ritsu and Katsumi are still looking for ways to hone the mock punch. Starting in the big toes, by fully using all 10 joints, you can surpass mock speed. Mock speed is 1225 kph. Therefore, each joint must twist faster than 100 kph. Then how can they achieve it? Ritsu thinks the spine is key. 
The backbone is made up of 31 bone joints. Among them, due to their function, 17 joints can accelerate simultaneously. That's a total of 27 points of movement. Lock speed can be broken. Katsumi wonders will this be enough. Ritsu says that it will not be enough. This move has even more potential. There is potential for adding even more speed and weight to your fist. Katsumi thinks he can produce even more speed by thrusting with the first through the third joints of the fingers. If that's not enough, and he will add weight to that high speed, then use his head. The heaviest part of the human body, the head. By making full use of it, the weight of the head can be added to a piercing nukite. It's the most perfect weapon in karate history. Now Ritsu understands why Katsumi were called lethal weapons. Suddenly, Sea Emperor Kaku appeared, surprising them. He watched them practice and found that Kasumi's move was still imperfect. He told Ristu to hold an egg. He cut the egg with his hand and kept it from falling. He explains that that's not just a total of 27 joints. If you want to accelerate a move, any number of joints can be added. 100, 1000, or any number you like. He tells Katsumi to forget 27 joints. All Kaku needs are the ones from his shoulder to his fingers. There are only a few joints, but Kaku achieved supersonic speed. In reality, he's used only a few joints. But the truth is quite different. Regardless of its actual structure, the way he imagined it is different. The imagination knows no limits. Katsumi thinks that's ridiculous. There's no way the imagination can overcome reality. The egg for what reason is the egg a body surrounded by a shell? It is to protect the frail body. It desired a strong shell. For example, those tree leaves that grow far above its head. I want to eat those leaves. By wishing that, the giraffe stretched its neck. The elephant stretched its trunk. They did it to survive. The stripes on the zebra. The stripes on the tiger. The spots on the leopard. The mimicry of the insects. Birds' wings. The cobra's poison. They're all for their survival. It was the animal's tenacity for life. Thanks to that, they achieved incredible evolutionary changes. Katsumi continues to imagine. Like this, no, like this, no, like this, this is it. He was successful, this is it. He can feel it now. His preparations are complete. To throw the greatest punch, this stance is necessary. And his image of the joints is like this. Even he is trembling. He's just letting a punch loose in an empty space. He's trembling before making such an ordinary move in a dojo. He throws a punch into the air that breaks all the glass windows. Even Baki heard the sound of that move from a great distance. Baki thinks he also has to hurry from now on and start training. He start fighting a mammoth in his mind. Tokugawa accepts Katsumi's request to have him become Pickle's food. He had two conditions. One, that it started at 6 in the morning. The other, unbelievably, is that it be held at the baseball stadium, not the underground arena. He warmed up by running from home to the baseball stadium. His mother was at the gate waiting for him, and she says she invited the person who is the most important to him, a precious person who cannot be replaced. He doesn't care who his mother invited because no one is more important to him than her. Then his mother left. Another woman came. That's the person she invited. This is unbelievable. Also, she is his birth mother. Turns out, it all happened 15 years earlier. Invited by a close friend, Dapa Orochi was amazed when he visited his friend's circus. Katsumi Orochi, aged 5, he was amazed at the 5-year-old prodigy's physical ability and talent. Then, the boy's father died in an accident. From that time on, Dapo and his wife took over the care of the boy from his mother, adopted him and raised him. Katsumi immediately hugs his birth mother. Tokugawa is also moved by their reunion. Katsumi has two loves, but there is nothing false about either one. How lucky he is to have two mothers. Baki suddenly appeared in front of Katsuki after fighting the mammoth. He never thought Katsumi would go before him. Orochi also came to cheer him on. The 55,000 members of the Shinchinka Dojo came to cheer for Katsumi with a basic karate move. That symbol, now gathered in a group of 55,000, rained down on Katsumi. Even though it was early morning, they assembled here at Tokyo Dome in order to inspire their young leader. A single exhale of breath transformed into a huge shockwave when 55,000 breaths were released together. Under the direction of instructor at Sushi Sudo, with unwavering leadership, they shouted from the pits of their core. Their young leader had now matured more than enough to fully accept the incredible expectations that had been placed on him. Pickle immediately rushes to Katsumi and is pushed away by Katsumi's five punches. Tokugawa doesn't know Katsumi Orochi was so powerful. Baki found that he's grown significantly stronger. Pickle's smiling. He unleashes a kick that sends Katsumi flying several meters. Katsumi feels like he's just been hit by a truck. He successfully blocked it, but still, he's taken so much damage. He begins to imagine joints. From this moment on, the smile on Pickle's face disappeared. 
That was when Katsumi was elevated from plaything to food. In that distant land, only the mightiest enemies, only those did he eat, because they were the mightiest enemies. The law of the jungle is absolute. He alone continued to defy this law that was defined by God. He only ate those that attacked him. And now, this mighty enemy forces him to take the same stance. Playtime was over. Pickle's posture was now identical to Yuujiru's. Katsumi steps forward and uses that move. The sound waves it created amazed everyone. At that moment, the image that crossed Pickle's mind was the steel tail swing of his rival, the T-Rex. Pickle falls, and everyone cheers, thinking Katsumi won. Pickle, for the first time in the 190 million years of his life, felt an unfamiliar pain in his belly, something the weight of a T-Rex's tail made a direct strike into his stomach. Just as Katsumi expected, even for someone like Pickle, if he's hit with a mock speed blow, he'll definitely go down. But there's one more thing. If Katsumi punches someone with a fist at mock speed, his fist will be destroyed. Pickle had been knocked down, a feat that no man had ever achieved. But it was at the expense of a fist, the lifeblood of a karate fighter. But the fighter was delighted. His body had mastered machine speed. Now, every move he made was guided by this new calculation. Kaku also admits that Katsumi has mastered the technique. But now, he faced a problem directly caused by that mock speed. Albert explains that Katsumi's injury was not caused by the impact on Pickle's body. It's because of the air from breaking the sound barrier. For example, when an airplane accelerates, it naturally meets resistance from the air as it charges ahead. The resistance grows stronger in direct proportion to the acceleration. Then, the moment its speed breaks beyond 1225 kph, it the sound barrier. The issue here is the burden placed on the object when it breaks the sound barrier. There are numerous reports of tragedies. Sometimes, even airplanes made of metal haven't been able to withstand it. We all believe that air offers no resistance. But when his hands and feet exceeded 1225 kph, they bore a terrific burden. It took both hands and his left foot to finally achieve a true advantage. But Pickle is already recovering. He's already getting back his smile. He's getting up. How preposterous. The one who struck was on his knees, while the attack looked down upon him. Albert says, I'll admit, you martial artists are powerful. You far exceeded my expectations. I acknowledge that. But just think about it. Pickle's rivals were beings from primitive times. They were the size of primitive beings. I can say this one thing for sure. The attacks of those creatures of 15 tons, 15,000 kilos, can't possibly be weaker than an attack by 100 kilo Katsumi. Pickle's gonna do that move. Katsumi's made no mistakes. He hasn't made a single mistake. But as a result, he's destroyed both his hands and one foot. Just look at their faces. They are worried. He tells them not to worry. He still hasn't used it. The move that only he has mastered. Pickle dashes to him. Katsumi's thought of nothing but striking his opponents. Landing moves powerfully. Landing them swiftly. He's built the muscles to deal powerful attacks. As a result, he's developed his own original. Cutting edge, most powerful, greatest, and finest move. Someone's blood was splashed on the stands. The whip is a tool that can achieve mock speed through human locomotion alone. The moment the whip achieves its maximum speed is here. It isn't achieved from throwing the whip. It is the exquisite moment when the tip turns to come back. He put his whole life into landing strikes and he did not have any doubt in doing so. And what he achieved was an even greater mock, an even greater shockwave. But they're not a whip. They don't have multiple joints. They're just regular bones. Everyone froze when they saw his arm. He's awakened from the dream. He has nothing else to use. He made it in time. He is the one still standing. This victory was given to him by everyone. Kaku admits that in just a few days, he has advanced Kung Fu by 50 years. While everyone was cheering, Katsumi heard Pickles snoring. Turns out he was just sleeping. Albert explains that he's just taking a break. As for this fight, it's already over. It's clear to anyone's eyes that he's suffered grave damage. If this fight had taken place in nature, there would no longer be any need to attack Katsumi. Pickle just sleeps and waits until his opponent stops breathing. Pickle is crying. Katsumi remembers Tokugawa's words that Pickle loves those that attack him. He eats those that he loves. Eating them, that is his farewell. So he shed tears. Katsumi is thankful. This man, the most powerful man ever since this planet was formed, has acknowledged him as a mighty opponent. His efforts have paid off. Pickle immediately tears off his arm. Katsumi admits that Pickle won. He's going to let him eat him. Tokugawa arranged the shooters for this case. He apologizes for not keeping his promise to Pickle. However, Orochi comes and tells him to ask them to put their guns down. He says, you plan on bringing shame on my son, do you? There was an unwritten promise made between Katsumi and Pickle man to man. It's not something you have any say in. 
He'll keep his promise. Across all time periods, races, cultures, and intelligences, there is one behavior that all mankind practices, regardless of differences. For some reason, humans place the palms of their hands together. Katsumi's arm was meant to be a trophy of war, but it was granted by a friend. Though Pickle may be savage, he was human. Though he may be a primitive man, he was his friend. Be challenged. Fight. Win. Eat. Be attacked. Fight back. Battle. Win. Eat. In that age of constant battles, he took from those far larger and more powerful than him. It made him proud. And now, a new enemy faced him. An enemy smaller than him. He kicked with small feet and punched with small hands. He is a weakling without claws, fangs, or poison. But his attacks were incomparably intense. This one's fangs, that one's horn, and another's stomping power. He was on par with them all. Some things can be understood without language. Most likely, this small male has made a sacrifice. Even without knowing the word sacrifice, he understands the essence of sacrifice. This male obtained a powerful weapon in exchange for enormous effort. Even with small hands, even with small feet, even without language, Pickle understood something. He transformed those small, soft things into fangs, horns and claws. This achievement was an irreplaceable treasure. But still he offered up such a precious treasure. Effort, sacrifice, frailty, consolidation, honoring, and treasure. Without knowing a single word, he understood. For the first time, Pickle chose to withdraw empty-stomached. Pickle's body had been filled with a mysterious feeling of satisfaction. The 55,000 members of Shinchinkai at the stadium have gone. Naturally, not a single one of them had left. Every last member was kneeling on the ground. They were unable to bear looking down on their reputable leader from above. Without any command, they all knelt on their own. By lowering their gaze, they display their devotion. Baki was filled with regret. Out of jealousy, he couldn't hold back this rude comment. A few days later, Ritsu brought some tea to visit Katsumi. That smells nice. The tea leaves and Chinese tea are fermented. That's why it has a very rich flavor and aroma. Ritsu fully understands that it's inconsiderate to say this to Katsumi now that he's lost an arm. But he really envies him. It's incredibly vexing. Katsumi says that he won't be humble. Anyone who lives by fighting, by martial arts, would have been jealous. That's the kind of fight it was. However, it goes without saying, he didn't achieve this alone. Of course, there's you, see King Ritsu, and see Emperor Kaku, and their numerous predecessors in China, Okinawa, and Japan who, for thousands of years, never for one moment stopped evolving. The breath and warmth of the hundreds of thousands, millions of their forerunners, and it will continue into eternity. That fight was a collaboration between Japan and China. Baki brings a bunch of flowers to visit Katsumi and says you didn't win. Ritsu is angry, but Katsumi feels it was something that needed to be said. Katsumi says, I may have lacking strength, but I fought my utmost. I won't let you deny that, and there will not be a greater match for me. Do you think you can pick up where I left off? Baki comes and says, I sure will. Inside the basement, Baki is feeling wonderful. This has never happened before. He can't picture even the vaguest image or shadow of Pickle. He can't get a full picture. He's seen him with his own eyes. It's burned into his mind. Those extraordinarily long, ferocious hands. Those legs like sturdy springs that power swift movement. Those clear eyes lit up with the flames of primordial times. His skins. His mouth. Those overdeveloped canines. And his appearance when he fights. But still, he can't picture him facing him. He can't envision it. Ritsu goes to find Baki to see how prepared he is for the fight. Baki asks, what the heck is Pickle? Ritsu also don't know. Neither he nor Katsumi know. Not even the people who fought him knew. Unfortunately, neither Katsumi nor he were able to trigger Pickle's total potential. Knowing this, Baki becomes extremely excited. He's going to slug it out with an unfathomably powerful dude. Ritsu sees Baki's prepared himself. He tells Baki to contact Tokugawa tomorrow. Meanwhile, Jack, Baki's brother, went to Pickle's place. The male was delighted. Just by staying here, wonderful things happen. And again today, an unbelievably fantastic toy has arrived. It's different from that one and different from that one too. He'd never seen this type before. It was the kind of ferocity that brought back nostalgic memories. Jack wants to have a bite off with Pickle. His biting power has developed so much, he can bite a coconut to shreds. Though unable to understand language, Pickle understood it like an infant understands its mother's heart. Like two lovers who approach one another without exchanging words. Meanwhile, Baki calls Tokugawa. He wants a fight tomorrow. Tokugawa replies that you are late. He tells Baki what he is seeing at the arena. Jack was lifted up and flung away. Half of Jack's face was eaten, but he is still smiling. Just as Pickle is close to him, he punches Pickle's chin. That's a real punch from Jack. 
it sent even Pickle's giant 200 kilo body flying into the air. Jack feels this feeling, but it's not the same. In the past, he's punched many jaws, but Pickle's is totally different. It's as if his jaw alone weighs 200 kilos. He couldn't even send a quiver through Pickle's skull. Tokugawa wonders why didn't that strike knock him down. Albert shows up and says I've been watching this fight since before you arrived. This is no time to be amazed at Pickle's sturdiness. That's the fighting pose once defeated Ritsu. The punch that Jack hit him with a moment ago has fired him up. Another way to look at it is that Jack pushed Pickle to his limit after a mere two punches. Baki and Ritsu arrive and are surprised to see Pickle being flung away. Though Pickle was flung 20 meters, he had already started to get up. As Baki watched, he understood that he was too late. Jack steps to the stands and throws him back into the arena. Good food, good drink, women, money, status, and glory. Jack's abandoned all those things. He only needs one thing. He's satisfied with a life lived for just one thing. To be strong. He never quit practicing, even to the point of incontinence. He took drugs until he nearly died. He wanted to grow large. Using bone lengthening, he obtained height in exchange for intense pain. All of his biological activity is to obtain strength. For this one thing he has strived for. And now he represents the modern age. Jack vs. Pickle is a fight between the cutting edge and the most ancient. Pickle came from long ago, in the Cretaceous period. Though he had never seen a mirror, he quickly understood that what he had in his hand was a part of his body. The silence in his right ear. The silence in his missing left ear. The silence in each ear was different. Hatred. Unforgivable. Jack continues to attack, but this time he misses and hears some sound. Pickle dodged it at the last second. This dust cloud. Jack wonders why is there so much of it. Everyone saw what happened. Jack tried the attack again, and the result did not change. There's that sound again. He missed. Albert recognizes the move of Pickle from that era, a move from the Cretaceous period. It turns out that Pickle jumped back to dodge Pickle's attack, used the wall 10 meters behind him like a spring, and returned to stand where he started, looking smug. Jack once heard this story. Let's say a human and a cat had to fight in a cage. A cat has many weapons humans lack, like claws, fangs, and reflexes. But most of all, their motor coordination and speed are two aspects where humans are far inferior. So without a weapon, humans cannot make up the gap. Even if the human is dozens of times persistently complain them. That's what this is about. Meaning, Pickle moved with a speed that could never be matched by those dinosaurs' reflexes. The first time, Jack asks a favor from God. He wants to win this match. However, the results were not unexpected. It's over. Pickles announced victory with a dance. He starts to cry. A worthy opponent is a good friend. They meet, fight, and victory is decided. And as soon as it's over, they must part. Because the victor eats the loser. When Pickle approaches Jack, he suddenly senses the danger of a certain insect. Long ago, when Pickle was still a youth, he was assaulted by an enemy smaller than him for the first time. Eventually, he killed the rather pesky creature. He took apart the squashed being and ate it. In his mouth, its honey sack burst, illing his mouth with a bewitching sweetness. Then it happened. A shock. There was a sudden shock that spread all over his mouth. This sensation felt far worse than pain. It was as if his mouth was suddenly a volcano, spilling magma. He wasn't sure when, but he lost the ability to move. He engraved into his mind that some things do not die even after being killed. Jack was clearly one of those. Even in that state, he was certain this man had something left in him. People are surprised to see Pickle sit down without eating him. Tokugawa was sure that Jack was unconscious. He approaches and touches Jack. Baki stops him, but it is too late. Fortunately, Tokugawa's height was too short, so he accidentally evaded this fatal attack. Even while Jack's unconscious, if Pickle had continued on and touched Jack, his middle fingers probably would have pierced both of Pickle's ears and most likely severed his medulla. If that happened, that would have reversed the results. It was a cell memory he had engraved into himself. Even unconsciously, Jack can still unleash the most powerful attack. Soon after, Jack was taken to the hospital. For the time being, he needs to stay like this. There will be some scarring. Also, his cervical spine suffered heavy damage, but there are no neurological issues. His body is in good shape, after all. The doctor explains that even when a human has lost consciousness, in fact, even after a human has lost their life, they can still take action. This is a story that took place under the special circumstances of war, but it's a true story. Soldiers captured the soldiers of their enemy's domain. Since it was wartime, they were immediately put to death. As they awaited their impending deaths, the commanding officer of the captured troops made an outrageous proposal. 
He said, after I'm beheaded, I will pick up my head and run. I will run down the line of my troops. I want you to spare all the men that I am able to run past. The enemy soldiers laughed uproariously. They said, go ahead and try if you can. He was immediately put to death. Unbelievably, he ran. He ran down the whole line of his troops while carrying his own head. In which case, it's something Jack Hammer would do. Awake or asleep, he's only ever pursuing strength in life. He is sure to have thought about how else he could fight on after he was defeated and beyond. He must have engraved his plan into every corner of every cell in his body. The nurse panics and informs them that Jack has disappeared. He goes to Pickle to continue the match. Let's continue. Pickle took five consecutive kicks to the face from Jack's powerful legs. How much damage had Pickle suffered? In actuality, not very much. Before, he had fought daily with beasts hundreds of times his weight. Even though Jack had powerful legs and even though he had powerful fists, his weight and Jack's weight were nearly the same. So, why is he running? It was no longer an issue of strength or might. Pickle's never seen anyone like this man before. A man who won't die after being killed, who won't die after he's dead. That one, and that one. When they died, it was all over. Like how people dread ghosts and like how people avoid the inexplicable. Pickle also fear whatever it was that made Jack what he is. However, a person can only turn their back on fear for so long. Exactly two minutes after the fight had begun, his pride at being undefeated in the Cretaceous was ignited. It was a defeat that he sought, one he himself could acknowledge. Even if he did want to acknowledge it, the coma he was in was too deep. It was the second time in his life he had lost twice in a day. Jack continues to wake up in the hospital. He wants to go to Pickle's place to continue the fight but was stopped by Backy. Backy says, that's why I know it's over. You, you're through as a fighter. After being forced into unconsciousness a second time, what Pickle did, what was done to Jack, when Jack heard about it, nothing could be more disgraceful to him, a warrior. Pickle carried Jack from where they fought. He carried Jack very carefully. He handled him very carefully, so as not to drop him or cause him any more injury. Of all things, Pickle was attempting to preserve the giant Jack Hammer to be eaten later. He didn't bury Jack. He handles him carefully, not as an enemy, but as a meal. A few days later, Tokugawa tells Yujiru that Baki is waiting for Pickle to make a full recovery. He says it's not fair now, so he'll wait. He's right in front of him. Two men are facing each other in the underground arena without spectators. Tokugawa asks, do you think Baki can win? The great fighter, C. King Ritsu, was defeated. The reborn Katsumi Orochi was crushed. Even the beast, Jack Hammer, also failed. They'd be the most powerful warriors of the Earth Defense Force. It would be no surprise at all if any of them could defeat Baki Hanma. Yuujiru says that there's one thing that Baki's got that three don't. Baki's unneably got his blood. He's clearly of Hanma lineage, while Jack inherited very little from his bloodline. Tokugawa heard that animals in the wild can survive for long periods without eating. But Pickle must certainly have reached his limmy. Albert tells him not to worry about it. We've already got the food that Pickle killed. It's T-Rex. He had someone bring Pickle 40 kilos of T-Rex meat. Pickle brings it into the arena and invites Baki to eat with him. Well, if you insist. You know, this is actually really good. Thanks for this, man. I'm stuffed. Wait, if Pickle's full, will he even fight? Albert says that he won't fight, never again. Albert's team is currently achieving great results. Using the T-Rex meat that's been preserved, they're working on using biotech to reproduce it. Pickle will never starve. If he's satisfied, then naturally, he won't need to fight. Just like we normal people, who enjoy dessert after dinner. Back he couldn't keep waiting. He approaches Pickle and pats his cheek. Pickle couldn't understand language, but his wrath was set aflame by this obvious provocation. It wasn't the least bit violent, and was actually quite gentle, but the soft approach deeply injured Pickle in a way he never had been before. Backy says, you understand that I insulted you. Pickle, you've evolved. For the first time since you were born, you're fighting not to eat, but to defend your pride. Hanayama and Tokugawa arrive and learn that the match has just begun. The most powerful male of the era of the dinosaurs versus Backy Hanma. Pickle's appetite has been satisfied. Ritsu's sure Baki will communicate to him that fighting itself is a culture, not a means for hunting or eating. Surely, Baki will convey to him that this fight is to defend his pride, to protect his dignity. He will communicate this kindly, and in terms that couldn't be any easier to understand. Pickle jumps up and lets himself fall freely from a height of 30 meters. Everyone is surprised to see Baki and Pickle still standing. Ritsu thinks that Pickle may be, but for Baki to be able to stand up immediately after that is impossible. Baki feels his internal organs are in total chaos from the shock of hitting the ground, his diaphragms being forced up as far as it'll go. 
It's crushing his lungs. No matter how tough Baki is, falling from that height, it's more than any human could endure. The primitive man saw through him. His playmate might appear to be fine and as uninjured as he himself was, but it was camouflage. Pickle could sense the truth that the man had suffered grave physical damage. Though he stood there looking like he was ready to fight, inside, he was writhing in pain. The primitive man felt regret. He thinks he treats this plaything too roughly. He plans to pray. Baki feels humiliated when his opponent prays for him, and so his pride took over. He momentarily forgot the overwhelming pain. But his lungs had been crushed, and he found that he could hardly speak. Pickle releases a punch towards Baki but it slows down just as it is about to hit him. Tokugawa may not have understood, but the experienced fighters knew what it meant. You see, they're not dangerous. Everyone's afraid of them. But you're perfectly safe when I use them like this. All right now, then let's play. Play with me. In the past, Baki's endorphins had been triggered by physical damage or the danger of physical damage. But now, it was the absence of danger that his brain reacted to. Pickle's playful blows would not have hurt a fly. But they had struck Baki in his weakest point. They had hit him where it hurts the most. In his pride, Baki suddenly stepped up to a height of 30 meters. He jumped down and said, I'm sorry, Pickle. I made you worried about me. I'm the one who started this fight. I'm the one who provoked you. And yet you ended up having to pity me. I know you've been around longer than me by millions and millions of years. But I don't need your pity, old man. Pickle was confused. He knew that camouflage was used by things pretending to be dead, or feigning weakness, or by things trying to trick your eyes in order to avoid detection. Camouflage was used for survival. And yet, Pickle had seen this man repeat that same action that had so badly hurt him in the first place, thereby increasing the damage to his already gravely injured body. Can such a camouflage as this exist? Baki rushed to throw two punches, but missed. However, everyone was surprised to see Pickle fall. Ritsu can't speak with certainty, but he has an idea. Whether it's ancient dinosaurs or the best modern fighters, nothing has been able to deliver a blow strong enough to overcome the resilience of Pickle's body. He thinks Baki realized that no direct blow with foot or fist would ever shake that primeval brain. That's why he struck him with just the surface of the skin. The punch doesn't land. It only grazes the chin. It's a technique used in the boxing ring, albeit rarely. A sudden flick of a boxer's glove, so quick it's mistaken for a miss, and the other boxer goes down. Sometimes, never to get up again. A thin layer of skin on the unguarded jaw is just grazed. But the blow is so fast that it shakes the jaw, and, imperceptibly, the brain, at a super high speed invisible to the naked eye. So he didn't miss him. The result was, Pickle lost the normal functioning of his brain, which must have been very puzzling and alarmed to Pickle. One minute he's untouched, unhurt, and standing upright, and the next minute, the ground is coming up to meet him. That attack would have been something completely outside his experience. Pickle's in a state of utter confusion right now. It was just as Sea King Ritsu surmised. Dazed by a blow he hadn't even felt, Pickle now saw, standing there before him, a man who had been on the verge of death, who hadn't even begun to recover from his injuries. This man had transformed himself into a sorter who could control the ground beneath their feet. Pickle's whole body was trembling, but still, he didn't run. He had overcome blows, he had overcome weight, he had overcome strength, he had overcome danger, and he had even overcome that. A sense of invincibility was engraved in every particle of his being. He had come here and been challenged by small men with the strength of giants, and he had overcome pain too. But this was different. This was a new experience beyond his comprehension. The unprecedented experience of his body slamming into the ground. Pickle couldn't do that, make the ground move like that. He'd never thought of making it move. Even that thing couldn't make it move. But Baki could. The primitive man knew he would barely be able to hold his own against this little giant who could move the ground. Baki still hasn't recovered from the first fall. He can't attack him head on. Not yet. He starts using a strange technique. Ritsu panics and says, Baki, you're a born genius. Baki pats Pickle's shoulder. Pickle looks very painful in spite of all his toughness. Ritsu explains that it's known as the hip strike, and it has the same effect on everyone, from babies to Yujiru Hanma. It's taught in the Japanese art of Kudo. It's a hybrid form of martial arts. In Kung Fu, it's known as Columbus's egg. The muscles are relaxed until they're loose and flaccid. Every part of the body goes completely limp. Strangely enough, as the body is made loose, the hands and feet increase in weight. At last, when even the tension in the face has disappeared, the body becomes a whip. At this point, it's no longer a question of looking for an opponent's weak spots. Because now the target of the attack is the largest organ of the human body, the skin. Whether it's the skin of a hardened, well-honed warrior, 
or the soft flesh of a young maiden, a blow to it from a perfectly flaccid hand is equally painful. It doesn't matter whether you're a child or an unconquerable man, the intensity of the pain will be the same. They've never seen Pickle in such a defensive posture before. Even he has to defend himself. For him, this situation is like nothing he's ever had to face before. Baki's attack stung him badly, but it stung his pride even more. Pickle began using that technique, which had once defeated Ritsu. Ritsu suspects that Baki is fully aware of that already. Again, the whip strike. Hold on, that's something else, Kokaiken. A style of kung fu that integrates the form and strength of a tiger. But Ritsu doesn't understand. Why use King Fu at this point? Yasoken, Toroken, Saruken, Yushoken. But of all those beasts Baki's so perfectly emulated, there's not one of them that wouldn't be prey for Pickle. Even if Baki did more than just emulate them and actually transformed into those animals, they could never win against that savage. What's this? What is Baki going to emulate next? This is an animal as well. But what? Whatever it is, Triceratops. Pickle was utterly bewildered. This man was less than half his size. And yet, in this small, supposedly helpless figure, he sensed he was facing the most powerful opponent he'd ever known. The impression of boulder-like weight and enormous power, as if a colossal tree had learned how to move. The iron will that never wavers until the enemy has been destroyed. Those things, all those things in this body. Here, in this little body, he could sense their presence. What now? Has Baki got something else up his sleeve? It's a flying bird. Lou, that's a T-Rex. Pickle had seen this sorter move the ground. Now he watched him changing shapes. He could no longer envision the man in his true form. In Pickle's eyes, he had been utterly transformed into the mightiest beasts that roam the earth. It's truly incredible. It's like magic. Pickle's never seen a monster like this. The T-Rex's teeth and tail. The Triceratops' feet and horns. The Pteranodon's wings and talons. The powers of three formidable foes, all in one single animal. Each of them is already monster enough. Every last aspect of their strength had been engraved into Pickle body. Here it comes. The teeth, the horns, the talons, and the beak. All at once, Baki's attacking. Genius is the only way to describe how he's handling things until now. Pickle may be the greatest of the Cretaceous period, but he's a novice when it comes to martial arts. Understandably, he mistook the pain as that from a T-Rex's teeth. Baki, now you're going too far. He plans on hitting him head on. Pickle uses the wall as a springboard to attack. Baki suddenly stops. He drops his stance and faces Pickle. He takes the full force of him. There wasn't a moment for him to move. However, it was Pickle who flew off. He quite literally flew high and far into the air. At that moment, Baki's only movement was this, like he was shooting away a fly. Baki provokes Pickle by marking his territory with his urine. He says, while you were cowering up there, this place has become my territory. Pickle is extremely angry and returns to the arena. That's enough of the tricks. Back to basics. As fellow homo sapiens, as humans, let's fight. Baki wanna do this at least once. A head-to-head -head fight. He was smashed by the ground. Was this what he expected? Or more than he expected? Even when he blocks, it's like the arms that he blocked with have turned into weak spots. Pickle's strength is superhuman. How would Baki Hanma stop this guy? Baki's lived for 18 years. Mindfully, very cautiously. He has lived to win. He's followed in the footstep of the most powerful being on earth, Yujiro Hanma. There's one thing that's very clear. Yujiro Hanma's strength. There's no denying it. Every last inch of him is faultless. In a way, you could say it's trust. He's followed in his footsteps. He's equipped himself against those fists. He's pictured their speed. That's why he can dodge them. A single blow can lead to serious trouble just by touching him. He can dodge it. Even more last second. More effectively, Pickle had seen many kinds of speed. On land, in the water, in the air. And today, another new experience. A speed that defied the concept of speed. He didn't go through him, he ghosted by him. At that moment, from Pickle's memory, at first, half in sport, it was out of a desire for a snack. He learned they weren't so easy to catch. He got it. He was sure. He silently realized then that there were beings in this world that could travel through his body. Pickle wonders who is this male. Just how many tricks will he use? Everyone was amazed to see Baki's fighting abilities bring this high a level. It was no surprise Pickle was amazed. The location of his elusive opponent was right up close to him. His left hand gripped an invisible saber that drove into the fighting bulls, or rather, Pickle's weak spot and penetrated deep. Pickle had a feeling the coming pain would be great. He had two memories of this engraved into him from past tough battles. Here it comes, the greatest wave of pain ever. The impact and the intensity of the tremor tells him so. 
Here it is, just as he imagined, even greater than he imagined. At any time and in every situation, the crotch always works. It seems that Baki has made Pickle's blood boil. They were both trembling, with nervous tension, with anger. It's close. This fight's been a long one, but the finale is close. This face, this stance, this is his final form. That's what we all thought. They see it, the same scars along his back. It can only lead to one answer. From the shape of the scars, their size, their era, the true falchions were the Tyrannosaurus's teeth. Pickle was a man who had survived the jaws of a T-Rex. It was Pickle's final form. He is rearranging the major joints of the shoulders, elbows, wrists, and hips. His shape was truly uncanny. With the awakening of his primeval memories, the already sturdy portions became even more solid. The powerful portions were even more ferocious. Baki thanks Pickle. That transformation, that metamorphosis, he accepts it as the finest appraisal, his friendship. I'm right near you, inside your space. I'm not going anywhere. From this distance, right here, I will repay your friendship. Pickle's mighty blow didn't send Baki flying. He hasn't budged from that spot. Even though he punched Baki with all his strength, he couldn't send him flying. Baki simply met it with the same strength but quicker and at a sharper angle. This is skill. This is evolution. We've obtained martial arts. We haven't left anything behind. I won't give way a single step. Suddenly, Baki sees it. It's the same with him. Innumerable teeth, innumerable claws, and innumerable horns. The friends that support Pickle for what he is now. Pickle is crying. Baki's never seen a more formidable enemy. He wonders what should I do in a moment like this. What can I do? Baki gets it. So that's what he decided. Not blocking or dodging and the fist can't strike. It has to already have been swinging. In response to the opponent's movements, the body must flow with the fight on its own. The giant teeth that attacked Pickle. He busted them with my clenched fists. The sharp claws that assaulted him. He grabbed them, twisted and broke them. When he was targeted, this is what he did. In that era, he was the greatest. But he's getting cornered. He's completely cornered. His size advantage didn't work. His strength advantage didn't work. What incredible might of skills. What unbelievable fighting ability. He was bewildered. Then he's moving. It's the lightning fast teleportation he used in his fight with Jack. Pickle is on the run. And Baki is catching up. He was on the verge of victory. Although glory was within his grasp, something sprouted in the heart of young Baki. A bad habit was born. Both fists thrust out forward before him. Pickle soon realized that it meant this was a fight of stamina. It was a greed beyond redemption, an insatiable avarice. At this time, Baki rejected victory based on skill, and instead recklessly and thoughtlessly pursued a straightforward victory based on stamina. As a result, it wasn't long before the difference in stamina manifest. As inevitably as the sun rising in the east, or water flowing to the lowest point, the pathetic result was reached. Pickle performed a move. Amidst this contest of strength, he felt the fear of losing. In this lengthy contest between modern and ancient man, the ancient man obtained a weapon. Their deadly battle had ended. Pickle isn't moving, while Baki couldn't move even if he tried. Pickle got up and went somewhere. Well, Baki took off before the doctor knew about it. This is so ridiculous. When hurt and feeling depressed, there's a sight Pickle likes to see. Around here, this place has the best view. Baki comes and watches with him. These days, in schools, in workplaces, in restaurants and in homes, people debated what to do with Pickle. In France, Germany, the US, India, and in the United Nations, there was fierce worldwide debate. A vote has taken place to decide to put Pickle back in the original rock salt layer, or let him live with us in the present day. The result is 500,001,572 votes for putting him back and 500,543 votes for him to live with people. There was only a slim margin of 1,000 votes in the result. A decision was made. Albert thinks that humanity is foolish. This result can only be described as unfortunate for Pickle. However, Pickle escaped from the lab. It seemed that someone had helped him. He appears in front of Albert and disappears into Tokyo. 